Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, can we compare our results with one another? This is a pretty essential question in science and therefore also in our field. That is something we set out to answer. Last small angle scattering conference, four years ago in America, I presented the results of another round robin study where we looked at how consistent uh, the data was that we got from the various laboratories. What we did there was to send around pairs of samples. We collected uh, the data sets from, uh, from the various laboratories. We then analyzed these with a splattering of software and then wrote a paper about it, which created some opinions. Uh, in particular, this opinion stays in my mind. It's reviewer three who said, there is an opinion that many national labs do useless research. And this type of papers just uh, only reiterates such allegations. So fun times. Um, so what we did, we collected these data sets, we fitted them. Uh, here's an example with MCSAS. We got some population parameters out. These include the zeroth mode or the total volume fraction of particles, the mean uh, radius and the width of the distribution. When plotted, the various entries uh, showed that we, uh, that we have a, um, a, deviation of the, uh, a deviation from the median mean of about, well, I would say about 1% uh, for 50% uh, of you were within 1% of the median mean and uh, the 95% confidence interval was within a few percent, so not so bad. In terms of widths, um, this was uh, about a factor of 10 worse, which is to be expected given the nature of the second mode of the population. Um, so that's uh, within about 10%, so 50% of you were within about 10% uh, of the median uh, width. So yeah, volume fraction showed about the same thing, about 10% uh, uh, variation for 50% of the entries, with the 95% confidence interval being a little bit wider than that. So this time, we took a look at the next part in this chain. If I do an analysis, uh, are my results comparable to when you do an analysis? Um, in order to test this, we sent around four data sets. And <clears throat> I did not want to be too uh, annoying and give you all kinds of wacky shapes. Um, I found four samples, which all of which have scatterers which are more or less globular. On the top left, we see a uh, sam uh, sample for data set number one. This is a bimodal gold nanoparticle dispersion. It's created for the NP size project, another project. Um, and that was measured uh, at the PTB. Likewise, uh, sample two was a narrowly dispersed uh, silicon nanoparticle dispersion, um, also more or less globular. Sample three was a bimodal silica powder that we put together ourselves from two monomodal uh, sili silica powders. You see that these populations for the silica powder are about a factor of 10 uh, away from each other. Sample four is a commercial sample. This is a, uh, a nano diamond powder, which you can get. Uh, it's, pr it's produced by Plasma Chem uh, in Germany. Um, and they claim that their uh, nano diamonds are between four and six nanometers. However, we will see that their powders are actually quite polydispersed. These are the data sets. Um, you see the ones that, are, that were measured at the PTB are on the left-hand side. They deposited this in a Zenodo repository, which is where we uh, gladly obtained them from. Um, and they're rather nice. They show all these fringes, especially for, uh, for the narrowly dispersed silica nanoparticles. The uh, powders are measured on our machine. They're, they are therefore uh, measured over a very wide range, which is kind of nice because for this bimodal silica powder, you nicely see the two sets of oscillations and a strong structure factor. And this complicates matters, and I will get to that later. Um, and the nano diamond powder, uh, um, some said that this has, this has some fractal nature. However, based on our understanding and based on our electron micrographs of this powder, this should just be a very dispersed uh, 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 set of nano diamond particles. On the left-hand side, you also see a blue line. This is a fit using MCSAS-3, which is the successor to MCSAS, just as an example uh, to show that it can be done. 
the residuals are in gray and they're on the background. Um, on the right hand side, these red fits have been done by my colleague, Dr. Glenn Smales, um, using SAS fit. And he is showing off over here because meanwhile, he can make absolutely stunning fits with this software package. So after a couple of months, we got some entries back. Um, most of you analyzed data sets one and two. Uh, these were uh, more straightforward, I would say, than three and four. Three and four have both had kind of strong uh, structure factor effects. Um, in terms of software, we had um, we have a seemingly healthy ecosystem of software out there. Uh, we got results from all kinds of software, including um, homegrown software or uh, software that people wrote themselves, which on the one hand is good. On the other hand, this gives us problems because all of these software packages report distribution with, in particular, uh, differently. Um, and this causes problems later on, but let's stick with the means for now. Here I've shown the, uh, um, on the left-hand side, the size histograms that come out of Maxas. Um, and on the right-hand side, the uh, particle size distributions that come out of SASFIT. Now, these two things, histograms and particle size distributions, are two fundamentally different things. But it doesn't matter for this explanation, because what I want you to look at is these marks underneath. The green and the yellow marks are the means that were reported by the participants of this uh, round-robin study. You can see for the dispersions, this is quite good. Um, uh, uh, population one is green, population two is yellow. Um, for Even for the bimodal silica powder, it's not all that bad. Uh, when we get to the very polydispersed sample of the nano diamond powder, the results uh, span a much broader range of, um, of sizes than would be justified by the sample itself. Um, if we also want to take a look at the width, I find it useful to look at this in a two-dimensional way where again, on the horizontal axis, we have the deviation from the median mean. Now, I'm not saying that the median mean is the correct mean, uh, if there is such a thing. Um, however, it is something that we can define and something we can compare against. And we see that 50% uh, that of the answers were within 2% of the median mean, which is quite good. But 95% of the, if you look at the 90, oh, sorry, 90% confidence interval, which is indicated by these whiskers, you see that that is within about 10% of the median mean. Not quite as good as I, as I, had, uh, as I had initially hoped. In terms of the distribution width, uh, this is on a different scale. 50% <laughs> of you were within 50% of the median width, but the, um, the spread of the results uh, extends well beyond 200% uh, of the median width. A problem with this is because of the differences in the in the in the reporting that is done. Um, even though I specified in the answer sheet that the widths should be uh, should be indicated as the standard deviation in nanometers, um, I think many of the participants uh, copy and pasted the width result that they got from their software directly into the answer sheet. And I understand that because converting widths from one type to the other type is a non-trivial task. And this can be very, very complicated, but it also means that we may not directly be able to, co to compare these widths. Um, when we look at the powders, at the powder results, uh, so the previous one was only for the dispersions, these are for the powders, we see that things are a little bit worse in that, in that field. Um, in that the uh, the means could be determined within a little over 100% and the widths, they were many hundreds of percent, uh, uh, varying with many hundreds of percent. So obviously we have some work to do to get our powder results comparable. So in essence, we have trouble. Now, what kind of trouble did I, uh, did I notice uh, during this round robin? Firstly, um, we have no systematic approaches, not even for, for relatively common samples like uh, spheres in a dispersion. Uh, if we provide a guide, this may give us more consistent answers. We define population widths differently in every single piece of software, as far as I understand, um, which are not comparable. Um, simple unit conversions go wrong, and here is where we, as a community, have shot ourselves in the foot 
we have not agreed on uh, on inverse angstroms, nanometers, centimeters, meters, uh, or even two theta as if it were copper. Had we agreed on something, then we would not have to do these unit conversions, we would not waste our time, and we would not make uh, uh, stupid mistakes in converting. Um, so yeah, that's that's really a massive time waste, but you know. Um, well, fourthly, uncertainty uses optional. I would highly recommend using uncertainties in the fit because they, uh, they weigh the fit towards the data points that are more accurate. Um, and they will give you a convergence criterion or a goodness of fit value, which has meaning. And that will allow you to qualify your fits compared to somebody else or some other models. Lastly, your model choices may strongly affect your results. And that is the case for these powders. Choices of your structure factor have, a, have an influence on the population parameters that you get out uh, of your size distributions. Now, um, I can demonstrate this, but I didn't want to spend too much time on this. I want to spend some time <laughs> looking at some incidental results. We asked people to indicate how long they have been working uh, with small angle scattering. So that's on the horizontal axis. Um, it's the number of years that they've been working multiplied by the percentage of time that they spend doing small angle scattering. And on the vertical axis is their self-assessment of how good they are, how good they uh, consider themselves to be. And what is your level of small angle scattering knowledge? And we see there is a reasonable correlation between these two. So the older you get, the longer you spend in small angle scattering, the better you think you are. But does this then mean that your results are closer to the median? Well, unfortunately, that correlation is very, very weak. So if we want to get more comparable results, I suggest that we do more than just get older. And I'm talking to myself here as well. I'm also starting to get older and that's not enough. We need to do more. So to conclude, um, what can we do now? Note, there might still be flaws in the analysis. Um, I would recommend things that would immediately improve the consistency of our results, including creation of a guide to the analysis of standard samples with some cross checks, you know, are the sizes that you get not outside of the Q range that you measured, et cetera, et cetera. Um, removing unnecessary dichotomies would be a great help, but I know how hard it is to agree on anything in our field. Um, but if so, we would save our brains for the stuff that matters, the actual fits. Um, I would recommend using uncertainties to direct your fits uh, and use the goodness of fit values to qualify your fits. And let's talk about reporting conventions because having every piece of software report bits in incompatible formats does not help. So we might be able to agree on something like distribution modes, which are uh, universally applicable to any population. These are the total, the total value, the mean, the variance, the skew, and the kurtosis. Um, the, um, these four modes work for any population that you can get, and they are therefore inherently more compatible and uh, more comparable. So with that, I would say thank you very much for listening, and I am ready for questions and comments.